here's another video on my TI-99. I think this is my seventh one, something like that. Um, this one is because my buddy uh, Quinn, who I'm still making these videos for, and with, I guess, not with, but, you know, together we're trying to go one for one. And um, he's been making some on the Atari recently. His most recent one has been on PlayStation. So if you're into that system or um, classic games, check it out. Uh, he plays three fighting games. Uh, I want to show this because I've got some new toys. Here I've got something called the Final Grom. It's an SD card reader. It allows me to play any uh, TI cartridges. Um, I don't really know what else it can do. I think it might have other options. It has two buttons. One of them lets me reset the system uh, in the cartridge, and the other one um, will allow me to um, set a cartridge, and then I can restart the system by pressing this and the same cartridge will be in there and it'll act like just like the original cartridge. The second thing I got is something here on the side. I'm not sure how well it shows up, but this is going to allow me to use Atari 2600 joysticks. I've already tested both of these products. They work great. And luckily it turns out my um, TI wasn't broken. My uh, previous joystick adapter from the early 1980s uh, didn't work properly anymore. And I'm going to do a close-up on some of this stuff. This is kind of a high angle view. I want to show uh, the Final Grom again. I think this came out in 2017 and a friend of mine here in town uh, showed me it on his TI computer and so I thought I'd get one too. And again, this is the uh, adapter so I can use the 2600 cables. I also purchased th these from Arcade Shopper so if you want to get some, get them from there. Let me do a close up on what some of this other stuff is. All right, this uh, cartridge has a 3D printed case and it has um, an SD card adapter. It actually has a micro SD card in it. I bought this SD card at the same time as I bought this and it uh, works great. Um, for a small uh, subcharge, I was able to have it loaded with a whole bunch of software on it already. And that made it very easy because I don't know too much about the TI-99. So I appreciate that that was uh, available to me to be able to do that. And now I'm going to show this from a slightly different angle so you can see my PEB is also plugged into the side so they're both plugged in at the same time. This is the right side of my TI-99 and this is with my um, final Grom inserted and on this side I have my PEB so this is 256 megabytes of compact flash. I think this is I think it's a one gigabyte card but I've, there's hardly anything on either of these. This one has a flo um, flop, some floppy disk images, and these have a whole bunch of cartridges and things like that. And I will, uh, yeah, I'll show some of the, how this works. Uh, as I've been saying with my syncing problems, I'm going to probably pick up a new computer. Um, my wife was going to buy me one this past summer for my birthday. Oh no, for, excuse me, for Christmas of last year, and it's going to be Christmas of uh, 2020 soon. So uh, my son this past weekend helped me pick some choices, and I'm probably going to pick one up in the next few weeks and get a, a capture card that'll allow me to capture and sync video a little bit better. He does a lot of streaming, and it works out good for him. Now I'm going to show you my joystick adapter. So this is my Atari joystick adapter. I'm going to plug a joystick into it. I'm probably going to get in the way of my camera. I use a slick stick. I'll show you that set up in a minute. So how it works is I probably get in the way of my camera and I insert it into here, just like this. And so that's port one. This is port two. And I don't think this computer supports paddles, so I can use a regular Atari adapter with it or Atari joystick with it. And I've done it very successfully. Uh, previously, my, attack, my old adapter would work with the cardinal directions, but it didn't uh, support the joystick and um, maybe one of the directions, something like that, I can't remember. So the thing I don't think is so great about this is it kind of doesn't go in too far, and um, you kind of have to be gentle about it. But Arcade Shopper, where I purchased this, already figured that out, and they have a, a solution for that. I'll show you that next. Now I'm going to show you um, a minor problem, it would be a major problem, but it's not because of the solution that uh, was granted to me uh, for like five bucks or something. There's two problems with this, and they're because it was made inexpensively, and I don't mean cheaply, I just mean, mean um, the price of this was inexpensive, so it didn't come with, this has a, I don't know if you can tell, maybe I'll even go in closer, but it has an acrylic plastic covering on it. This is not standard, I paid an extra couple bucks to have that installed. And my joystick 
don't know if you can tell, but any movement. Doo, 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 doo. Whoops, that's not good. Not going to be ever be able to play very many games with that. So I'll show you what you can do with it to fix that problem. I wanted to show my old adapter, which is broken and it's molded plastic. Um, in comparison to this one, they're approximately the same size. This one stays in a little more snug because this end is longer, and um, so that works better. But like I said, there's a solution for that. So that's the size. And I'm going to back out a little bit here and show you me plugging them both in. All right, here's the old adapter. This is the adapter that uh, I came with this. Well, it didn't come with the computer, but it's when I got it, it had it. So this plugs in really snugly. And while you could get it out if you mess with it too much, it's going to stay in there pretty easily. And here's my second adapter. And this one, when you put it in, it's it comes out pretty easily if you're not too careful. Well, well now it seems to be staying. Well, it didn't do that when I was playing games. <laughs> so a little with the joystick attached, it doesn't stay in too easily. But that's the joysticks going in and out. I wanted to give a better shot of this uh, acrylic. So this is the bare PCB underneath this acrylic. And luckily, um, this was applied because in shipping, this. It came in a padded envelope, which was well packed. I'm not saying it wasn't well packed. It came really nicely. But the package, I mean, it didn't look like it got run over by a truck. I once had something that literally got run over by a truck. It was totally destroyed when I got it. But this wasn't. This was just handled poorly in shipping. Um, but this acrylic saved the side of the PE, uh, yeah, but the printed circuit board here. And I don't know what happened, but uh, it broke off. And the piece was inside the bag, but I'm not going to try to bother gluing it back on. But luckily that was on there, so otherwise it would have uh, really damaged it. So that's the back of uh, this, and that's the front. If there was a printed uh, 3D case, that would be pretty neat to put on this. So what is this high-tech solution to stabilize this joystick adapter? It's simply a short... Um, I think it's a 9-pin serial adapter, actually, straight through. Um, I was also able to buy this from uh, Arcade Shopper. Can't recommend that place good enough uh, or high enough. They're great. Um, so let's see. This is what you do. You take this, and it goes in, and it plugs in quite snugly. And then this plugs into this side. And now any play um, that happens to this doesn't really affect this so much. You could probably also, if you wanted to, tape this to there or whatever, but I have not done that. So, I have it plugged in, and that is all I need to do. Great, and now I'll show you a little bit more. I'm aware that the picture is flushed out. That's not what the big deal is here. I just want to show you everything set up the way I use it. So I have the joystick plugged in. I have the final crown. I have my um, nano PEB. And that is basically almost all I own except for one other cartridge, um, which is Munchman for this system. And I'm going to try to get some uh, better pictures and uh, talk a little bit about how the final ground works, but this is not a tutorial about using it. I'm going to actually show some video separately of just me playing games because there's plenty of people who show off the final ground and how it works, and also the Nano PEB, and also this um, uh, joystick adapter. So if you're interested in just one of those things and want to see how it works or understand it better, you can look them up easily. Um, you can find more information about them at Arcade Shopper. Also, some of these have their own websites, and finally, there are people who have done reviews of, I think, all of these devices. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I just want to play some games for my buddy. This isn't a great angle to be shooting this, but I do want to show how the systems all work together. So, first I have to shut all this off. All right, so when I want to use this, I have to first turn on the Nano PEB. So the Nano PEB is on. Next, I can, well, I can turn on the TV anytime I want, but I'll turn that on next. And now I have my final grommet there. I turn it on, and you probably can't see the TV too good, but it looks perfect here. And then I have my adapter here. Um, I'm going to actually just start up a game for the heck of it. So I'm going to go into menu system two. You might not be able to see what's on the screen, but you will be soon. 
able to see it. And I'm going to start up um, maybe uh, a demo. And um, let's see what this, this one does. If I'm right, I think I, it's the uh, Don't Mess With Texas demo. It takes a little while to load because it's quite large. Yeah, that's this one. So this is a demo written by a demo group a couple years ago, and it really pushes the TI um, probably to its limits for what it can do. Um, and, uh, this one's easy to find on the internet too, there's high quality versions of it, so check it out if you can. Begin using my system. It looks like this because I have my Nano PEB plugged in. I have the Final Grom also plugged in. And I'm going to go into my Final Grom. And here's my menu. And I can um, look at some of the demos. This is all preloaded. I didn't put this on there, but I can. It just uses the FAT uh, file system. And um, that's something that's uh, FAT16, I believe. And um, I'll show you the games, which are in alphabetical order by type. Uh, the first game I tried on here um, was uh, Donkey Kong, so I'll show you that real quick. Not because it's so great, but it's, uh, I was just curious to see if my joystick worked uh, with the button with this new adapter, and it did. So I'll start up Donkey Kong, and I can see it doesn't look too great there, but uh, it does play pretty good. And um, Now I can't remember how this game really looked on the ColecoVision, but I'm guessing they look pretty, pretty close together. Oh, poor dead Mario. Well, I could keep showing it here, but I just want to give you an idea of what this uh, would look like. So that's it for me uh, shooting like this. I'm going to try to do some uh, direct capture now. So we have my recording going, and this is the difference of playing Donkey Kong with direct input and uh, when I was pointing my camera at it. Uh, the colors are pretty much right this time and I'm happy with the results. I actually recorded 15 different uh, programs being played over about 25 minutes or so from the final ground. I like the way it works pretty well and I have no complaints with it at all. I love it. It uh, has allowed me to play a whole bunch of games and I also want to investigate some of the utilities that can be played uh, and used from it. And uh, like I would like to also, I think there's a 64 column text mode available, um, things like that. Um, I'm actually only going to play this game for a short while and uh, eventually, I mentioned it earlier at the video, I plan to try to get a better um, recording setup and this computer is uh, it's getting kind of old and I need to upgrade a whole bunch of the software on it and I'm using Windows 7 so I plan to get a newer computer with Windows 10 and an actual PCI video capture card, which uh, should allow me to record and uh, play games without delay, hopefully. Um, and even if it doesn't, I, uh, I just need a new computer. This computer's, it doesn't allow me to use some new software, things like that, that I need to do. And I need to um, like uh, get a new version of Premiere Elements because this one has some issues. Um, so as I'm playing this game, I am having some issues with my joystick, which I pretty much corrected. Um, I got out a screwdriver and I tightened uh, two of the uh, screws down because the bottom connection of the slick stick and the top connection were a little bit loose. And that um, there's a little, I can't remember if it's steel or plastic inside of the slick stick, but it, it uh, allows me to uh, not have to, when I press up and down, I can go up and down the ladder a little bit easier. Uh, next up, we're going to be playing a second game, and this one is going to be called Astro Fighter. And as I was going through these games, I actually did choose the games before I started making this video, but I didn't choose them because I wanted to play them or anything like that. I chose them very quickly, and uh, I, when I played this earlier, uh, pointing the camera at it, I actually got much further. But I'm not playing to get far into these games. I just wanted to try to give a taste, a sampling of uh, what can be played from the final ground. I include demos, I include uh, homebrew games, I include cartridges, and I think uh, that gives a good representation of what's uh, available on the TI-99 4A computer. This is Astro Fighter. I like the music. The game is okay. I didn't play it for too long. I want to talk to my friend uh, Chris out there. That's Chris++ directly. He uh, 
probably thinks I'm terrible at video games uh, because of how poorly I'm doing in this. And I'm not going to blame it on the joystick or anything like that. The joystick's doing okay. I just, um, I'm not trying my best or even very hard. I'm actually just playing it to give an example of, of gameplay for this video. I like the colors here. Everything, of course, reminds me on this system of playing games on the ColecoVision. They share the same video architecture, and um, I, they, like the games aren't exact. Like coming up, I'm going to be playing Pitfall, and Pitfall is a homebrew version, and it I thought it was going to be an exact duplicate of the ColecoVision version, and it looks pretty similar. And I think they even ripped the graphics from it, but you can see some subtle differences. That might have been because of the when it was ported, it was just easier to make those differences. But a really good example of the differences uh, is an actual cartridge that was released for both the ColecoVision and for the TI-99 uh, called Wing War, and it came out for other systems too. It came out for the, maybe the Atari 8-bit. Uh, there's a prototype available for the 2600, which is not worth playing. And when I get to that game, I'll talk about it a little more. Uh, and I'll actually bring up Chris again because he wrote an article about it. So I'm almost to the end of my gameplay here. I'll be quiet for a second so you can hear some of the sound effects, which hopefully have a pretty good balance and I've turned down low enough. Right, I'm just gonna fade out into the next game. This is a game called Breakthrough. Um, if the title reminds you of a game that you might have heard of before called Breakout, that is because it is exactly the same game. Unfortunately, in this version, you have to play with the um, joystick. There's no paddle available. I don't think, please correct me if I'm wrong, for this system. Um, that's okay. This, I mean, I've played a lot of games, not much, because I prefer playing with paddles, but I've played several versions that um, are actual, uh, actually played with either the keys or they are played with the joystick. And this is one of the better ones I've played um, with the joystick. Now I've played some superior versions of the game, but the control that they give to the joystick is just awful. And this one, I, I imagine if I played it a little bit longer, I could probably get used to it and anticipate a little bit better and play it longer with the joystick. There is no competition um, if you have a mouse or if you have trackball even, uh, but the paddle is the way to play Pong. The, the paddle is the way to play Breakout. And in this case, it's the way to play Breakthrough. I. Uh, I think the colors in this game look great. The ball moves uh, smoothly. I do notice that the colors look a little weird, um, and that's both on the TV, not the colors themselves, but like the text. And I think that's because they made their own uh, font, and I, it kind of looks like it's got color bleeding um, from artifacting. I'm not sure if that's the case. I don't know if uh, this system is capable of artifacting, but it looks like if you take a look on the side of Breakthrough and of uh, what, what is it, Diabetics, which is kind of a funny name. Uh, they look like fonts you might see on the Apple II computer with the way they get color bleeding. And that's um, something maybe every computer can get artifacting. I, I don't know. Um, I, I find it really interesting that the TI has so many similarities to other computers, and yet it's the only, well, it's not the only computer, but it's one of them that only used the 99,000 CPU. Next up, we have a game called Car Wars, and this was released by TI themselves. Um, it's kind of a clone of Dodgem. Um, I think this game came out for the 2600, and there was a version in the arcade. Maybe it was called Dodgem. Oh, I love that explosion. Does that look good or what? I mean, the car just really uh, explodes all over the place. The, uh, the TI impresses me with its uh, graphical proudness. Um, the sprites, this, these are multiple color sprites, so I'm guessing there's some sprites being overlaid over each other because I think the TI can't use color sprites. You know, I'm new to this system. I'm probably gonna look at this video in a couple of months and be like, man, I made so many mistakes. That's how I learn. Um, and that's how I enjoy uh, learning. Now, is that, yeah, like I said, great explosion. It's what, about four times bigger than my actual car. On to the next game. This is going to be Wing War. And this game actually has the instructions built in, which I think is a neat effect. So if you press function, and you get to see it. So you've got adventures, await, dragon master, collect crystals for power, obtain treasures from a cave, blast rocks, and sky for gifts. Uh, wish crystals and treasures in the magic fountains, and then take them to your lair. So now I'm going to start up the game in a second here. And I don't do very well. One of the problems with this game, and I found it on the, both the TI and on the other game systems I've played it on, it's the control method. The control method is 
not intuitive at all. Like in order to um, go up, you have to press down, I think. I mean, it's weird and it's supposed to be that way. Yeah, dig the music, it sounds good. Now, one big difference you'll notice if you've seen the ColecoVision version is your dragon here is quite a bit smaller than it is on the ColecoVision. I'd say it's about half the size, maybe not quite half the size, but it's not as big, but they, the graphics look so similar. I mean, and this game, it seems like it should be fun and it kind of is fun, but the controls just, I can't say enough about how much the controls don't work in this game. And I'm, I'm supposing you could get used to it. Uh, and my friend Chris Plus uh, Plus did write an article covering this game and we played it together. Uh, we've, he played it at my house. I think we actually, well, we, he, I think, I think beat the game, but I have a link in the show notes uh, below this video for the, uh, with a link to his article. So if you're interested in this game and some history about it and the, how it's played on the 2600 and on the ColecoVision a little bit more, and that's all related to the TI-99, give it a try and give it a listen. I think you'll enjoy it. Man, that's another thing about this game, just bounce around. All right, now we're gonna look at some demos. This first demo is called the hat animation. And once you see it, I think you'll be pretty impressed by it. I, I don't know if there's a high res mode being used for this. That's all it does. It's not really a hat. A lot of computers in the 1980s book covers would look have this exact picture on it and it would be still, it wouldn't be moving at all. And that's, this is all it does. So I just wanted to load it up and show you what it does. It's, and now we have another uh, demo, and this one it says it's an oscilloscope, but really it's a, a demo, like a demo scene. And this one will run for about, I think it just runs continuously over and over. But I'm not going to do much talking here. Although, I find videos with talking a little better. So, I like how the colors background changes. I think, by the way, if you're interested, every single video or game in here, you can watch in more detail either under emulation on YouTube or uh, on real hardware. And I, some of these games, uh, in particular, maybe um, The Legend of Tilda, I might play a little bit more, which is a, I'll talk about it more in, as the video progresses. And maybe uh, Car Wars, if I can play with a second player, um, I might try to play those some more. Plus I'm gonna explore the library of TI games. I want to uh, see games that were only made for the TI. I, I don't know much about it, uh, when I'm going to be playing some of these upcoming games, I notice that the video capture doesn't really do justice to how good the games look on um, a CRT monitor. Uh, I'll say that over and over. I'll sound like a broken record, and that's because it's true. They look better on a CRT. Give it a chance. Play on real hardware, man. This one is a plasma display. I actually thought it'd be higher resolution than it actually is when I'm using it. I tried to figure out a way to zoom in and out, uh, which reminds me, I didn't look up any documentations for when I played these games or anything like that. I just uh, loaded them up, looked at the ROMs images that were stored on the final ROM as it came to me, and played them. Um, if you're familiar with uh, plasma displays, uh, this one runs a little slower, and I think it's using a text mode. I'm not sure. It looks like it is. I like the way it looks. A lot of times uh, you'll see them zoomed out a little bit more, so the the squares or the rectangles look a little a little bit better, a little bit more, well, I wouldn't say clear, because that's not the point of these, but yeah, I really do like them. I imagine uh, people tried to make some of these in basic and they probably were slow. Although I don't really remember seeing things like this when I was using my Commodore 64 uh, back in the mid 80s and in the late 80s too. I don't, I don't think I saw them until the 90s, maybe on the Amiga first. This is the last demo I'm gonna show. And this one doesn't really do justice unless you're using it because this one you interact with and you can zoom in, you can zoom out. And it's a map of, a, of a, I guess maybe something that might be used in a game, a driving game, that's supposed to be a road. And I'm just moving the joystick left and right and up and down. And it looks like I'm, ra I'm randomly doing things, but when you're interacting with it, it, it's very impressive because it moves very quickly. And what would be neat for a game like this, and maybe that's where the person was going who created this, would be your car might stay in the middle of the screen and you would rotate your, see there, there's me pressing the fire button to move in and out, and your um, car might stay in the center of the screen. It's a pretty, pretty neat effect. 
I like it quite a bit. And it's fast. It's like, as fast as I move the joystick, it keeps right up with me. Yeah, whoever made this, is, uh, I'm impressed. Now we're up to the homebrew games. And this first one is uh, by Nano Chess. And I think I've seen games by Nano Chess before on the in television. I think his name rings a bell. Um, this one reminds me of Astro Smash, but it doesn't have the same gameplay. And when I was playing it, I tried to figure out how to play it with the joystick, but unless my shift key was in the wrong position, I, I only could play it with the cursor keys, which was okay. It worked good enough. I don't play this one very long. And then like you'll notice, I don't play any of these games for very long. But I like the way this one looks. It's very clear and it looks very smooth on the uh, on my CRT. In fact, I'd like to hear feedback. What do you think of the video capture? Does it look pretty good to you? Last time I asked about the audio quality and uh, I got just feedback from one person and they said the mix sounded okay. So I'm just gonna probably do the same mix as I did last time. And uh, another game that I only played for a short time. This next one is called Bouncy, and I think this might have been my favorite homebrew. Um, I've played games similar to this on other systems. I've never played this exact thing here. Now this game doesn't remind me of a game, particular game on the Sega Master System, but the graphics and colors do remind me of them. And I don't know if the Sega Master System has a, another generation of this graphics chip, um, but man, I. I would swear like some of the early Sega Master System games look just like this, I mean, with the graphics. So job well done. Um, and so obviously in this game, I'm this ball bouncing up and down. And my job is just to go as far, far, far as I can and collect these coins, I guess. I don't know um, uh, really who made this or if this is a game on other systems, but it seems like it's not an original game. I feel like I've seen it before. Yeah, I love the music too. Although it's kind of a game where the music, if it gets too repetitive, you might get tired of it. But I like options in games where you can turn the sound on and off. So when you hit these green arrows, you bounce higher and then you can make it, I think one extra block or three. So I just skipped three blocks there. I kind of like the idea of going back and being able to talk over my videos. The problem with that is I don't really get into the moment. so. Like when I'm playing these games, I'm pretty vocal. Um, it's probably amusing to watch me play video games because I'm like, you know, oh no, I just died, you know, something like that. And you miss all that. But then again, here, when I'm talking over it, uh, I get to comment on the gameplay a little more, like these scissors going across the screen, I love them. I thought that they made like a, a chopping sound, but maybe I'm mistaken. Oh, right into the dice. Man, that game plays a little dicey. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. So, like, uh, when you get these question marks, it can uh, unlock certain things. Like, that unlocked some hidden uh, a walkway that had three coins on it. And I like this because you can also move backwards. Like, if I wanted to, if I had enough time, I could move backwards and get that question mark that's in the lower right corner. And that one, um, I just got a question mark and it turned my ball green. So I'm now bouncing two squares at a time instead of just one. And that allows me to jump over gaps. Yeah, and as you can see, the uh, sometimes the uh, cubes that are uh, next to me, they dim, and that's because you only can have so many sprites on a scan line, which there's actually a, uh, an improved graphic chip that you can get for this that you can plug in that was made a few years ago and it's based on FPGA technology that actually fixes that problem. But I don't really see it as a problem. It's just how the technology they had at the time. The system came out in the, like, 1979, 1980, and that's what they had. The fact it's 40 years old and it can produce games like this, it looks great. Uh, now we have our third game. This one's called Castle Crisis. I kind of like this one quite a bit. It's fast playing. I don't think this one uses the joystick. I think it uses, yeah, this one only uses uh, four keys. So uh, you can go left and right, and you can jump by pressing diagonal, which I guess is not technically diagonal because it's just a fourth, a third and fourth key. Um, some of these games I'd like to revisit. This is another one, it's really simple. And I think I'd like to play a game like this with save states because you're able to like not have to play the same beginning screens over and over. Because once you get good at it like this, like this screen right there is just basically introducing like you to the concept of the game, which is just to get across to the other side of the screen and 
uh, climb the, the rope and hit the bell, which kind of reminds me of a game called Hunchback. Yeah, as I was going through these games, um, and some of the games I didn't show here, I became a little bit more impressed with the TI. Well, I, I know it's, I mean, it's an underrated game system. You don't hear too much about it. At least I don't. I mean, I, I used to own one, and I'm, I used to have uh, quite a number of cartridges for it. But I still, I mean, most of the games came out for other systems, so except for the original games, which I don't know how many of them there were, um, it, there's not a lot of reason to turn on the TI if you haven't, if, if you have these other game systems. Game over. This one is called Eric in Monsterland. It seems to look similar to the old one. I'm not sure if it was programmed by the same person. If I looked at the title screen, I could probably tell you. This one looks really nice. And as soon as I saw this game, I was reminded of a game on the Commodore 64. And the game doesn't play the same as it at all, but the graphics, the trees look like it. Although in that game, you can go, you have motion uh, from the background to the foreground and left and right. So what I'm doing here is I'm racing this witch and it's not only a race against the witch, you can see her at the top of the screen, but um, it, it kind of gives you an initiative to try to beat her to the other side of the screen. Um, and I think you get more bonus points when you do that. Now this is a game, when I first was playing it, I was like having some trouble with control and I worked it out um, and I think I played it this one a little more without being on video. In fact, I, most of these games I played a lot more without playing, playing them on video afterward. But I, I like um, I like these. I like the colors especially. Um, I think the system only has 16 colors, but they make good use of them. And some games I've noticed they use kind of like dithering effects, and that makes it, you know, looks a little bit more like there's uh, more colors. Although dithering doesn't work too good, I don't think, on CRTs. Or they, it works better on CRTs. It doesn't work too good if you're playing under emulation because the colors don't tend to bleed as much. And dithering kind of depends on that sloppiness of the uh, NTSC and artifacting. And, and while they, there's not true artifacting, the colors kind of, you know, bleed a little bit in NTSC and maybe in PAL too. I don't, I don't I guess on the Amiga I have experience with PAL. It's kind of weird looking at this. is the first time I've actually watched my gameplay. And as I'm watching, I'm like, that's a mistake. Don't do that. Don't do that. But that was a good move there. Man, Adam, you're such a good game player. Man. <laughs> All right. So as you can see, more uh, baddies get introduced to the screen as the game progresses. I like the, the mean looking face in, uh, in this uh, on the tree there that I just walked in front of. Ooh, this is gonna be a tough screen. I don't really make it. Well, maybe I do, but I probably don't. <laughs> Play over, I like that ending there. And this one is going to be the pitfall game I was talking about. Um, so I want to say uh, thanks again to Arcade Shopper. Now, if you compare this directly against the ClickVision, it looks pretty much the same. Uh, obviously, the gameplay wasn't ported directly because that system uses a Z80 processor. So I don't know how it was done by Retro Clouds. Like uh, if they took a Z80 to um, 9900 uh, CPU, converter because some things like that exist for other platforms. I don't know if something like that exists. I mean, it's not, I mean, you can't just obviously plop in a code and get it out, but you can like get routines uh, converted that way. And it makes conversions a little simpler. Or he might've just done this from scratch. I don't know. I do know that this game is a lot larger ROM size. Maybe it's requires 32K to run from floppy. I think this was released on floppy and on cartridge, man. This game always brings back some of my favorite memories of playing games. I originally saw this on the 2600 and that was in about maybe 1983 or so. I uh, lived in Connecticut at the time in a little town called Brooklyn and I would visit uh, my cousins, my aunt and uncle out in um, New York in the Bronx and uh, Whenever I'd go out there and they would come to visit us. When they'd come to visit us, I don't know if <laughs> where I lived in Connecticut was so boring, but they used to bring along their 2600 and my cousin uh, Anthony would, he would uh, actually bring along his Legos and uh, he would put together Legos. I remember once he uh, built a land speeder 
just out of his own head. It wasn't didn't look exactly like the land speeder in Star Wars, but he accidentally left it behind. And I never took that thing apart, and I would play with it all the time. He also left his little figurine in there. But anyway, back to Pitfall. He, uh, my cousin Michael showed me this game, and uh, he showed me the um, Pitfall Harry movement, and which I didn't really have anything else to compare it to. On the, uh, I didn't have a Commodore 64 yet, and I hadn't seen other games that had such high definition graphics. And those who aren't familiar with like playing these games on old systems, I mean, to look at a game like this, high definition graphics, yeah, they are. Money bag, all right. Tar pit opening, closing, whoops. Yeah. All right, finally, we have The Legend of Tilda. This is the last one I'm gonna show and then I'm gonna go out into credits with this one. So this game is not a Legend of Zelda ripoff as much as it looks like it. It's just the world map, you can explore it, and that's what I do here. I actually ended up, quote, playing this one for quite a bit. I was wondering how accurate the world map is, and entering, like, this would be level one. So I don't know if this person ever planned to make this into a Zelda game. I mean, that would be so much work, and I don't really know why you would do that, because the Zelda already exists in the NES. Um, so. Uh, would I think this person might have been doing? I don't know. I'd like to read more about it, and I might look into this a little bit later. Um, but whoever programmed this, she did a fantastic job recreating the world map. As far as I could explore it, um, it, it was accurate. Um, like here, look, I walk into the uh, waterfall here, and there's there it was. You can do that on the NES. Um, when I was done with this, my wife walked in while I was playing this, and uh, she'd come home from work, and she was like. I was like, hey, what is this game? And she knew what it was. And, um, but she didn't, you know, quite get the, how impressive it was. And I was trying to explain to her, I think she kind of got it. Um, um, so this is kind of a screw up here, but not really a screw up, but what happens if you go down there, it should just link to the same top screen, but instead it, it doesn't, which is fine. I can understand why he did that or she, whoever programmed this. Uh, whoever you are, you did a great game. And I did explore up there. If you uh, continue in that Lost Hills or Lost Mountains uh, and you go up a few times, you get to level five in the NES version. So look at this. I mean, it's so impressive. And over here, I wanted to see if I could get to a secret area uh, to see if it was, and it is there. Um, there's a uh, hundred free coins here in the first level of Legend of Zelda, and in the second level, I believe it is where you buy maybe the blue ring or something like that. It's been a while, but I could still probably beat that game in one sitting if my uh, thumb can, like didn't wear out. So I'm gonna get up to the second, uh, where the second level is, which is just two or three screens over from here. And then I'm gonna uh, close out with credits. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Uh, I really enjoyed making this. I'm having fun with the TI-99. I want to uh, uh, thank my friend for uh, kind of introducing me to uh, the wonders of it and showing me some of the hardware that's available for it. Well, I read about it, some of it online. I, I, I hadn't, I, I don't think I would have bought it if I hadn't seen it at his house. Um, he really uh, showed me some really great stuff you can do. So uh, this, uh, this is the end and uh, thanks to uh, what a Quinkadink and my friend Quinn Techrec for getting me to make these videos.